Riding a bike is great exercise, and an active lifestyle is the most important factor in the prevention of disease, including breast cancer. But most women pay very little attention to their breasts until there's a problem. I'm your host, Casey Jones, and today we have a cancer specialist, Dr. Ben Johnson, here to discuss the secrets to healthy breasts. His breast wisdom could save your life or the life of a woman you love, so stay tuned. If you've seen the DVD, The Secret, you may recognize my very special guest all the way here from Georgia. Welcome, Dr. Ben Johnson. Casey, it's great to be here with you in Dallas-Fort Worth area. Thank you so much, Dr. Ben. We have seen in October every year Breast Awareness Month. We see lots of pink and we hear lots of stories about women who have the breast cancer disease, but what exactly are we supposed to be aware of? of what's the awareness about or what should be about well I, I'm actually glad that it's named breast awareness month instead of breast cancer month because oh, okay. awareness is what we need to be about because as we focused on breast cancer there's something that called the law of attraction that we've gotten more of it uh, it seems at least statistically so we want to become aware I mean who who wants breast cancer uh, yeah, uh, not you me. know <laughs> do you want breast cancer so what we need to do is become aware of how to keep our breast healthy. Okay, so not a focus about the disease, but focus about health. So how do we focus on breast health? What are some of the things that we can do? Uh, you know, there, there are practical things that you can do, and there's uh, food and nutritional things. There's certainly exercise. Biking is a great exercise that creates lymphatic drainage and moving lymph around and, and moving tissues around so that they get good oxygenation. All of those things are, are really important. And, and then there's things not to do too, but. Uh, okay, let's talk a little bit more about exercise. Um, of course, our show a lot of times will focus on bicycling and how good it is for the, for the environment and for health. Are there any things in particular about bicycling that are good as cancer prevention compared to other exercises or, or other exercises actually better than bicycling in particular for breast health? Uh, you know, bicycling is about as good as it gets for breast health. You're, you're, you're moving the pectoralis muscles as, as well as a lot of other muscles. Uh, you'll have a few new sore ones if you haven't done any cycling lately. Uh, but lymphatic drainage is about moving muscles because lymph vessels don't have any muscles of their own. So lymph doesn't flow unless you're moving your muscles. And, and biking is just an incredibly great exercise for, for lymphatic drainage of the breast as well as, as the other organs. Okay, well tell us a little bit about lymphatic system because that's not one you hear much about. You hear about cardiovascular and you hear about you know oxygen or, or different systems, but you don't hear much about lymphatic. What is that? Well, you, you have three vascular systems in your body, arteries, veins, and lymph vessels. We are actually, we leak by design. There is not a little bitty arterial going to every cell in the body. So out there in the middle between your arteries and your veins, you leak and this fluid uh, bathes all of the cells with nutritionals, with oxygen, with nutrients, with vitamins, minerals, essential, essential fatty acids, all of the stuff that it needs. And then the cells pick that out of the fluid flowing by it. Well, it can't all flow back into the veins so there's a collector system out there called the lymphatics that's open-ended out in the tissues and it gathers up the lymph. Uh, it's also where the waste products are returned because they, all the cells are not only taking in healthy products, they're excreting their waste out into, uh, not into the veins because again, there's not a vein hooking up to every individual mm -hmm. cell. So it excretes it out into this swamp, if you would. <laughs> Uh, and so it recollects nutrients, minerals, amino acids, essential fatty acids that haven't been used and the waste and takes it all back into the blood system, dumps back into the blood system, and then the liver can clean it up and the, the, 
gallbladder and kidneys and spleen. You, you, your body filters and cleans all that stuff, lady, but it's kind of the garbage system of the body. Or it kind of reminds me of the drainage. Recycling center, too. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. It kind of reminds me of like the drainage system maybe in your neighborhood where you've got, you, know, you water your lawns and then you've got it all going down and then I guess it all collects into the water treatment plant and then you, you know, it goes back and gets recirculated so it's kind recycle of recycle what you can in. and what's waste you throw <laughs> out so it's a great recycling process so, and where uh, are the aren't the lymph nodes I've heard about people talking about like if certain illnesses maybe you swell up or something where are lymph nodes well lymph nodes like like the garbage center where they're taking out the plastic and throwing the waste over here and and separating stuff so lymph nodes are strainers in the middle of your lymph vessels and they're actually the first line of defense against bacteria, viruses, funguses that have gotten in through the skin or into the body, and they, they filter it and they identify it. Hey, this is, not, this is not self, this is not us. And then they gear up right there on the spot and start, or, or a cancer cell, you know, uh, that's gotten loose and traveled to a lymph node. That's why you start feeling for lymph nodes uh, because they catch the cancer cells there and the cancer cells are still growing, but they're, they're in a, closed space, if you would. Okay, and isn't there one uh, in the breast area that we might want to refer to later, or is that not the case? There I are, wasn't sure the under- There are the hundreds are. in the breasts. Okay, so, okay, well, we'll, we'll talk about the, that later. In that later. collecting system. Okay, because <laughs> I think that we've we've thoroughly discussed that, at least to the point where I understand it. We'll have to we'll have to get some resources and have you help us with that more later, but what else can we do, like um, understand that wearing garments and restricting uh, as a matter of fact, I have a couple of bras here. I thought maybe you could maybe you could tell me about the different types of bras and does it make a difference what you wear? It, it I've, does. I've you got know, bras underwear. Bras are part of our culture. Um, they they do a lot of things. We we they're they're a social statement. They're a statement of wealth. If you're wearing certain bras from certain places, um, you know we want to stay. Uh, we, we don't want to sag. We've seen the ladies <laughs> in Africa and the pictures in yeah. National Geographic. And we don't want to lay our babies in our lap and feed them from there. Right. <laughs> we want to hold them up. Exactly. <laughs> so yes. uh, I can relate to that, how being a mother is. <laughs> aesthetics are important <laughs> in our society, certainly. And so, yes, we want our, bra our, our, our breasts to stay firm and high and, and, and that, and that's important. But there can be some negative benefits to bras, too. Uh, Chinese medicine is very focused on energy flow through the body, and if you start talking about underwire bras, uh, then that certainly interferes with electrical flow through the body. It also decreases lymph flow and blood vessel flow. flow. Even the tightness of the bra against the breast, it's, it's creating pressure, and pressure decreases blood flow. Well, every tissue needs proper oxygen and nutrients. And we've known for over 80 years that low oxygen in, in tissues cause cancer. Dr. Otto Warburg discovered that in 1925 and won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1931 for discovering the cause of cancer, low oxygen levels in the tissues. So if you put pressure on anything in the body, but we're especially putting pressure on the breast uh, with, with some bras, it decreases blood flow. That's decreasing oxygen and decreasing nutrients. Is that a healthy thing? Doesn't sound like okay. a good formula. And vice versa. We were talking about lymph flat, lymphatic flow a minute ago. The same thing. Pressure is going to decrease lymphatic flow from the breast and therefore keeping waste products there hmm. longer in the cell area. So bras can be a very unhealthy thing. Well, it and sounds like then uh, a good thing for us to do is just we can now go here. We run out here, get the fire started. Uh, it's start time to burn a, our bras. Woo! Yeah, <laughs> we did that in the '60s. I remember those days. Yeah. Uh, we start a second movement of bra, bra burning. Here. <laughs> exactly. Well, we'll come back to some of these issues in just a second. You know, as a female, bras are part of the rite of passage. Just to become a woman, you're gonna try on bras and get your training bras. But just because we have always done something doesn't mean it's the best choice. Just as an example, there are modern medical procedures performed on women, and we're going to find out which ones are harmful and which ones are helpful right after this quick break. Every day, computers help our lives and businesses run smoothly, and every day there are potential targets. Viruses, spyware, and scams are relentlessly being updated, making it easier for hackers and thieves to steal information and control your computer. 
protect yourself. Get in the habit of keeping your cybersecurity up to date. Learn how at staysafeonline.org today. We're back with Dr. Ben Johnson, cancer specialist and breast health expert to discuss standard medical care in relation to breasts. But before we do that, we're gonna find out a little bit more about practical advice that women need to have about the bra situation because I wanna make sure that our viewers know you know, what should we do? What are the choices when it comes to bras? Well, there are two things that we can very easily change that increase our risk of breast, uh, having unhealthy breast or breast cancer. And one of those is bras, so I wanted to focus on that just a little more. First of all, if you, if you don't need a bra, if you're an A cup or so or smaller, then you probably shouldn't be wearing a bra. I, I, now, it's taboo for women to have their nipples show in, in America. So, okay, wear a camisole or whatever you need to, but if you're a, an A cup or smaller, you probably shouldn't be wearing a bra. If you need more support, then, then fine. Uh, the less thick a bra is, the less it heats the breast. There's another phenomena there that heating of the breast uh, increases cancer because things that are made to be cool uh, hang out from the body and be air cooled. If you heat them up, it increases breast cancer. So, mm -hmm. and as soon as you get home at the end of the day, take it off and then do a little lymphatic massage because those breasts have been congested all day by the bra. So just take both hands, rub, and then go the other direction. In fact, I encourage women when I give talks to do that 30 times a day. How do you do that 30 times a way? day? Well, y'all go to the bathroom 30 times a day. I don't know what y'all do in there. Guys only need about five times a day, but y'all go 30 times a day. So every time you get in that stall, you're in private. This is not about sexuality. It's about health. So do a little lymphatic massage because that bra is kind of putting pressure against the breast all day. So get the good in, get the bad out. And uh, so just make that part of your ritual of going to the bathroom. And it's a very healthy thing. Get the bra off as soon as you can. Do a little lymphatic massage and, and get everything flowing there. Okay, excellent. Uh, and the, the thicker the bra, the more heating it causes. And, and I prefer cotton bras because uh, okay. they eliminate heat and let heat flow through. So that's my choice there. Okay, thank you very much. That's very helpful to have some real practical advice that we can put into our lives. Uh, how about other advice? What about, you know, we're hearing all the time that we need to have a mammogram at a certain age, and I remember my grandmother actually talking about going in and having a mammogram and being squished and smashed, and mm -hmm. actually for years she would complain about it. her breast still hurt her. She felt it was damaged actually because of the mammogram, and of course that's the standard protocol now, and there's a lot of other protocols. Would you please talk a little bit about all the things that, that we're supposed to be doing or, or maybe shouldn't be doing? I agree with your grandmother. Uh, smashing the breast is not healthy because uh, you're causing damage and then you're irradiating it with x-rays. What do x-rays cause, Casey? Cancer. Okay, so and which tissue is more susceptible to x-ray damage? Normal tissue or tissue that's just been crushed? Well, it makes sense that a damage... Yes, a so we crush the tissue, it. make it more susceptible to radiation damage and then we x-ray it. So mammograms are really not a good screening test. Now if you think you have cancer, if you've got a lump, it might be appropriate. But probably more appropriate is to do an ultrasound and an MRI at that point. Okay. Uh, because you could theoretically smash the cancer and start the spreading of cancer right then by squeezing it. Mm -hmm. So uh, mammograms, uh, I was so proud of the American College of Physicians in 2007 came out and said we are way over utilizing mammography and we are doing it on women much younger than we should be. We need to rethink this idea, the smashing, the radiation, the age. So I was so proud of them for standing up and saying, stop, this is not healthy what we're doing to women. Because we know that x-rays cause cancer and then it also leads to unnecessary procedures and fear and oh my gosh, the doctor said I need to come back for another test. And, and all of the emotional issues yeah. that go with that. And, that and then, uh, so yeah, all the extra procedures, all the stress, uh, doing it too often, the cost involved. So what we're doing there is not healthy and the way we're going about it is not healthy. Well, and and there's the procedure been a lot, itself is not healthy. And there's a lot of investment too. I know that you know, a lot, almost all the facilities now have this 
mammography equipment, and so it's I guess they're cow. trying to get. You know, you yeah. hate to think about medicine being about money, but hospitals, as they've had people in house less days, they're looking for resources, and and thermography is a resource center, financial resource center. But because not only do you you make money off of that, then you get them in for other tests, mm -hmm. biopsies and and MRIs and other tests, and and that's all part of revenue. And if you're running a hospital and looking at the bottom line, you want to increase revenue. What about biopsy? You mentioned biopsy. What is actually a biopsy, and when should you have one? Well. Uh, there are different kinds of biopsies. There's a needle biopsy, of course, where you take a needle and you run it through a suspicious mass. You usually penetrate it all the way through and then pull it back out. I am very much against needle biopsies okay. because what you do as you penetrate, uh, a one centimeter tumor has a billion, that's one billion cells in it. Now you take a coring needle, now these needles are made to, to core out Oh, like a, a cookie sample, cutter or something. Yeah, or so that they bring them back out so they can look at them under the microscope. Okay. Core out, and so you're penetrating that, going all the way through it. You push some cells out the back side of the tumor, and then as you come out, you're dragging cells out and leaving them there. Now, you've just cut across veins and lymph vessels, mm -hmm. and if there was cancer there, you have just spread it. If it was contained before, now it is spread. So I think that's a pretty unhealthy thing to do. An open biopsy where you take out the whole lump intact, that's a much more reasonable approach. Okay. And then if, if it, they can take it downstairs and look at it on the microscope right then, do a frozen section, and if it is cancer, then go ahead and do what you need to do. I think needle biopsies are a poor choice for us to be doing. I think they may lead to death and, and damage and metastases. When you were saying that as the needle goes in and it pulls out that it's basically kind of reminds me of like maybe trying to take a sample of a water balloon or something you got probably stuff you know you've broken this this contained mass Absolutely. and I guess things are coming out and then you explained earlier that this things the the cancer cells are then in that lymphatic bath that's floating around the system and that I guess that's how these cancer cells then instead of being contained in a small area are now start floating around kind of like somebody that you know opened up a bunch of popcorn in a bathtub so or something. Those are the two real unhealthy things okay. that we're doing is the mammography mm -hmm. and the biopsy. And the needle biopsy. Okay. And then you know the, the mammographies lead to a lot of unnecessary procedures because they are picking up uh, what they have started calling cancer, DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ, and lobular cancer uh, in situ. Mm -hmm. And if you took s a thousand women who had died in a car accident or drowning or something at 60 years old and, and looked at their breast under the microscope, the vast majority of those would have DCIS. They're not going to die from that. But they take these women and say, oh, you have cancer. Let's take your breast off. And and then, and then, just to make sure, let's irradiate it and do chemotherapy. Way, way overboard. First of all, those women probably would not have died of that cancer. Now, secondly, they've, they've given them irradiation, damaging their lungs, their hearts, mm -hmm. and chemo, lowering their immune system and really damaging them. So this is not a healthy thing that we're doing. It is, it is not what is in women's best interest. Okay, well, why don't we take a look at some of the things that will be healthy and in women's best interest. But first, I wanna just share an experience that whenever you are going to the doctor, a lot of times you really feel a lot of pressure. I know that I've seen that in my own family and that really we are responsible for our health. And you know, modern medicine has actually almost become a religion demanding obedience but we are still responsible for our choices and it's all, like they say, a pound of prevention is a whole lot more effective than a pound of cure. So we'll find out more about what we can do for health in our breasts in just a minute. We'll discuss ways to be proactive with breast health so you can be one of the six out of seven who will never get breast cancer. We'll be right back. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Please won't you be my neighbor?
I'm here with Dr. Ben Johnson to discuss safe, effective ways to maintain breast health. We've already talked a little bit about exercise, but what about diet? You know, diet is really important because there are some things out there that are great antioxidants that are help scavenge, that help your body get rid of uh, things that are going to hurt us. Uh, so there, there's a, a nice list of things that can help your, your breast and the rest of your body be healthy. Yeah, you hear a lot about antioxidants in regards to cancer. What uh, antioxidant, what, how does that help with cancer? What does that, what does that mean? Well, oxid you have to talk about oxidants to talk about antioxidants. And oxidants are things that are left over from, well, that we get in on our foods, pesticides and things mm -hmm. like that, or that are byproducts of using up food in our body for fuel. And basically, they're looking for an electron, and in doing that, it's a very damaging process. They're going around trying to steal an electron from other atoms, and <clears throat> those are called free radicals. It's kind of like walking around, someone walking around in your house with a sledgehammer, mm. uh, trying to satisfy itself by knocking holes <laughs> in the wall. That's not a healthy thing. <laughs> That's what it's doing to the cells in your body and the molecules as it's looking to grab an electron. So antioxidants are substances that can donate an electron without being in a damaged state itself and thereby it quenches, it puts out the fire. Okay. It takes the sledgehammer out of the, the, the little guy's hammer. And, and so that's kind of how antioxidants and oxidants are, they're both, they're, they work together. Okay, so what are some that we should really in particular be looking for? What are some of the better ones you'd suggest? Well, uh, there, there's a phenomenal one out there called alpha lipoic acid. That was discovered in the 50s, kind of. We really didn't know what it was, but as research began on it in the 80s, we realized that this was maybe the most important antioxidant out there. It's important because it is not only water soluble, like vitamin E, for instance, is fat soluble, but it doesn't go into water states. Okay. And vitamin C is water soluble, but it doesn't go into fat spaces, if you would. Mm -hmm. So. We need antioxidants that can do both. Alpha lipoic acid is one of those that can is both water and lipid soluble. It's inside of cells as well as outside of cells, so it's kind of the ultimate antioxidant. Mm. Where do you find something like that? Well, that that's that's interesting. <laughs> the 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 supply outside of a pill from your health food store is found in red meats, wow. and, and that's you know we've kind of been on this <laughs> no red meat thing. <laughs> But that's the only naturally occurring place that you find alpha lipoic acid is in red meat. So, mm. sorry, vegetarians. If, if you're a vegetarian, like <laughs> go get some store. alpha lipoic acid. Right. Uh, you can get that at any nutrition store, and uh, probably about 600 milligrams a day is is a good, nice dose of that. It, it's also phenomenal because it helps other antioxidants recycle. It mm. keeps he helps them replenish uh, vitamin E. Uh, vitamin C, glutathione, there's a number of other antioxidants that, that it helps repl helps them to replenish because it's a coenzyme in the system and, and it's even a coenzyme in the Krebs cycle that, that's where our energy comes from. Hmm, so okay. it's a very important antioxidant. So that would be the first and most important antioxidant that we can have. Well the next one that comes <laughs> to mind may not be really high antioxidant, I don't know, but you hear a lot about red wine and how b beneficial that might be, and I like red wine, so you, if anybody you, wants to you, send me red wine, go ahead. You're exactly <laughs> right, the, and the, uh, a, a, glass, uh, a glass a day is good. More than that may be less healthy for you, but you can also get red wine extract uh, in the health food store where they concentrated the good and left out the bad, and uh, all according to your perspective on it. So. <laughs> Uh, okay. That is also a very, very good antioxidant and free radical scavenger. It also has some longevity in properties. It, it also helps burn fat if, mm -hmm. if you have any uh, mm -hmm. one in your viewing audience that wants to increase their energy burn rate, it naturally increases energy burn rate and, and decreases obesity and just gives you more general in, 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 uh, in general. Well, if you had to more just energy. talk about <laughs> one more ingredient or a substance that's really important for cancer prevention, what would that be? What would the third be well, in about Well, if you're talking seconds? about breast, uh, indol 3 carbonyl it uh, helps prevent uh, the bad kind of estrogen from forming in your body, the estradiol. It helps keep the, other t the, the estrogen in the other two states, and, and uh, so that would be where I would go with that. Okay, well there are a lot of substances and there's a lot of research that has been done out there and Dr. Ben has a book that will 
talk about in a little bit. But right now, uh, we'd like to find out a little bit about the other things that we can do to check our breast for screening, some of the safe ways. We talked about mammography, but there are other technologies out there. One that's 100% safe, even for pregnant women and children. So we're going to check on that right after this quick break. We've never been introduced. You wouldn't recognize me in an elevator. We enjoy different sports. But if you ever need it, I will give you my blood. When you help the American Red Cross, you help America. I'm back with Dr. Ben Johnson, expert on breast health, to find out the best way to monitor breast health and screen for disease. Dr. Ben, what about breast implants? What do you think? You know, implants are not related to a higher rate of breast cancer. They're just not. I mean, I'm not a fan of implants. I think it's a statement on our society, which is a very negative statement that women would feel the need to do that, uh, to feel womanly. Um, scar tissue is certainly not a healthy thing, but if you're asking if breast implants are related to an increased rate of cancer, the, the question is no. We absolutely know that for a fact. Okay. Uh, so, so they're not. Uh, all according to the type of implant, it can relate or, or hinder breast self-exam. It certainly hinders examination with mammography. So that's a, a negative there. Uh, if the implant is under the, the muscle or, or certain types of implants, then it doesn't interfere, interfere with breast self-exam at all. And you know, most lumps are discovered by their owners. <laughs> so doing a breast self-exam is still very recommended uh, by everyone that, that would be in a position to recommend them. And uh, yes, we, uh, unless you want to model, we probably aren't going to demonstrate <laughs> uh, that. I'm not sure they today. let me do that today, <laughs> but I know that you have a book coming out soon, and I know there's lots of materials out there, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. So, besides the breast self exam, which our viewers can find, basically they just need to do it. There's plenty of information out there to show how to do it. They just need to do it, and hopefully the show will remind them. So every time the show comes on, you watch the show, make sure you, you know, if you have breast, examine them. But besides doing your own self breast exam, what is a safer w alternative to mammography? Well, if you're in a high risk category, you, you want to be doing MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging. If you're in a low risk category, then you probably want to be doing thermograms. Uh, thermogram is a non-squeezing, non-smashing, non-damaging method to examine the breast, which simply uses an infrared camera. It's absolutely the most underused technology for breast that we have today and following breast. Now this is not a cancer detection device, this is a proactive device. Uh, it's a way for women to monitor their breast health ongoing. Uh, so it's one of the best preventative measures because you can see changing thermal patterns and, and if you've got a cancer growing it takes increased blood vessels to grow that cancer so that's where you're going to get increased blood flow and an increased thermal pattern. But there's nothing touches the breast. It's just an infrared camera out in front of the breast that images the breast and then you can see those patterns. Uh, and they're, changing over time. And they're fun patterns too because I went ahead and had the thermogram and hopefully uh, the viewers eventually get to see what that looks like. It's really colorful and very pretty and it was a really good experience. Like you said, no touching and they were able to, to take a look and there, you know, if there was a spot that worried them then, you know, they would, then I went and had a sonogram. But there's just, that's a whole other show. So we're going to have to ask you to come back, Dr. Ben Johnson. Will you Would come back to. and do a thermography show for me? Okay, great. Well, I appreciate that. And of course, a lot of this information can be found in your book that's coming out. Tell us really quickly, what's your book? The Secret of Health, Breast Wisdom. Excellent, excellent. So I'm going to have all the information that people need to know about your book and, and being able to find out about how to get it and the name of it will be on my website. But just tell us really quickly, uh, what is this book for you? Is this, is this your first book? And it, it is my first okay. book, I, but I, I want women to know how to keep their breast healthy. We've been so focused on cancer in that industry and we want women to keep their breast healthy and on their chest. Exactly, <laughs> and I want that for my viewers. And whether you're a male with females in your life or you're a female yourself, we all just want to thank Dr. Ben Johnson, 
who is willing to come all the way to Fort Worth to share his breast wisdom with us. So find out more about Dr. Ben Johnson and you can actually request a free chapter. He has decided that for my viewers, he's gonna give you a free chapter when you come to my website at areyoukeepingup.com. Thank you for watching and keep pushing those pedals for breast health.